Good afternoon. My name is Stacia Stelk, and I'm pleased to welcome you to Deep Roots Native Gardening webinar series. Deep Roots is hosting these webinars every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon at four o'clock Central Standard Time. And to find out about upcoming webinars or to watch one that you might have already missed, you may visit our website at deeprootskc.org slash slash, excuse me, stay home KC. Before we get started, don't forget to ask questions using Zoom's Q&A tool and make comments with its chat feature. At the end of today's presentation, we will take a few minutes to answer some of the most popular questions. This afternoon, I am happy to welcome Kristen Bontrager. Kristen is a graduate of Washburn University, where she studied biology and researched plants that colonize in the understory of invasive bush honeysuckle. Kristen is passionate about conservation for both environmental preservation and protecting the communities she loves in Kansas City. When not listing the correct scientific name to, of plants to anyone who will listen, Kristen enjoys reading books with her two cats, Grub and Dwight, who we might get to meet this afternoon. So please join me in welcoming Kristen for Managing and Removing Invasive Species. All right, Kristen, can we see you? There we go. Welcome, Kristen, how are you? Hi, I'm great, thank you. So uh, glad to have you here this afternoon, and I am going to stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours. All right. Hello. So as you can see, my beautiful background, which I wish I were in right now, these are all, this is a photo I took several years ago when I was happily working for Johnson County Parks and Rec as a natural resource tech, and I learned a lot a lot about prairie management and invasive species and this is one of the most beautiful pictures i found on one of their prairies and it's little purple cone flowers you can see um and my cats may come and say hello during the presentation they don't like to be left out so just let's just bear with them they'll just be in and out really quick um and i'm just here to talk to everyone about you know what we can do during a global pandemic to garden. Um, I personally have a very large plant order I'm waiting for and I can't do anything in my beds right now. And so I figure something that people can do to, you know, get, get their gardening done is prep your beds and learn about is what is growing around your beds because often that will be what ends up in your bed as a weed. And my background is in conservation. And so that means I studied a lot of invasives and invasive species removal and actually what happens after you remove invasive species. So if I'm just gonna give a quick little background of you know invasive plant versus a native plant. So an invasive plant is a plant that has been introduced. It did not co-evolve with our beneficial pollinators or even our predatory critters that you know keep plants in check from growing too quickly or taking over a lot of areas. So these predators are actually very beneficial, they help. And this uh, introduced plants, invasive plants, they have no natural competition in these areas where all the other plants, our native plants, do have a natural competition. And this gives them a competitive advantage. And a very specific example of that is my arch nemesis bush honeysuckle, uh, Lonicera macchii. And this one has a specific competitive advantage and the fact that it is the first plant out there to put out green leaves, which means it can start absorbing the sun and collecting resources and growing and spreading before all the other plants can. They also have the ability to have these really attractive to birds red berries and the birds will eat them and they will fly and disperse the seeds uh, via the birds using the bat birds pooping and they'll poop the seeds out and then they will grow more plants. They can also re-sprout when they're cut and on top of all of that, they have the ability to produce chemicals from their roots that inhibit other native plants to grow. So they just kind of make the area their own. And there's nothing that has evolved with that plant to keep it in check. So it just is able to grow and grow and grow. And this is an issue for one, because we rely on biodiversity in our forests and our woodlands and biodiversity not only just for types of plants, but ages of plants. So if you think about a forest and having, if it's only all old trees and something happens to all of the old trees, but honeysuckle has taken over the understory 
and not allowed any sunlight to come and penetrate through, then all of the young baby trees aren't gonna be able to grow and your forest is gonna be dead. And not only that, invasive plants tend to not have the type of deep root structures, but honeysuckle in particular. And so on the opposite spectrum with native plants, they are species of plants that have been here pre-colonialization. They have adapted to our climate. They have adapted to our drought type summers. You guys all know those days when it is extremely hot, extremely dry. They also have the ability to absorb a lot of water because they have been in this area for generations and generations. And the plants that can't take in water, they die off. And eventually the plants evolve to be have the abilities that they have now because of this. And our native plants are able to survive these terrible, terrible, brutal winters. I can barely handle them. I don't know how I'm gonna make it through another one. This makes our native plants perfectly suited for our environment. Uh, this makes them able to live with each other because they have natural competition. They have certain insects and certain animals and other plants that will keep them in check. So this allows multiple types of species to come and grow together, such as in a prairie. You know, you have grasses, you have beautiful flowers. It's just a gorgeous place. It's what's behind me right now. This is, and they are able to live in these changing environments. They can acclimate through years of adaption. Um, and the reason, like I said, about biodiversity being important is because anything can happen. And if you have a monoculture, one little thing can wipe, you know, think of all of those ash lined streets and the emerald ash borer comes in and infects them all and everything dies and you're just left with nothing. So that's kind of the main basic reason that biodiversity is important. So just a little bit of that background on invasive species and native plants kind of gives us an idea of why we want to weed our gardens and keep our gardens free of invasive species. And so for this being a gardening talk and how to prep our beds for the ability to plant and get ourselves ready, my main focus is going to be on a huge nemesis of mine besides bush honeysuckle, uh, fence encroachers. And I have dealt with them a lot. I hate them very much. They spread very rapidly. They'll climb up in your trees. They'll grow over your fences. They'll grow into your beds and you'll never be able to get rid of them. So there's three vine species that I'm going to address. And the first one we're going to talk about will be winter creeper. Um, and we're also gonna discuss Japanese honeysuckle, English ivy, of course, everybody's nemesis, bush honeysuckle, and garlic mustard. And so before we really talk into those, I think that everyone should be able to see what I'm talking about. And so I'm gonna go ahead and show you just a quick little way to ID these plants and what they look like. I'm sure most of us know but it, what bush honeysuckle looks like, but not everyone does. So let's have, go ahead and have a little look once it gets in there. So this is bush honeysuckle. We, I, I hate this stuff. It, uh, it's ruining everything. And so you can kind of see its leaf arrangement and its berries and what I was talking about. These are the red berries that are really attractive to birds. And this is a, a really good way to be able to identify them. So if you can see back here, we have the opposite leaf arrangement. Uh, that's one thing that you can look for in the springtime. And this kind of shows you what the difference is. So if you take note of how the leaves are organized in relation to each other on the branch, that kind of helps you see which one is opposite, which one is alternate. And we are looking for the opposite one. And how to identify invasive honeysuckle besides these berries is the leaf arrangement, which is opposite. They have very distinct flowers. They're white, they sometimes can be yellowish. Uh, these berries grow in clusters and they will stay green until late into November. And they also will green up around early March. So when you're driving by the highways or forests and you start getting excited, and this is why nobody wants to ever take hikes with me because I always ruin everyone's excitement. They're like, oh, it's green. I'm like, yeah, but it's a piece of honeysuckle. 
Um, and this is, so these are the beginning of the uh, fence encroachers that I was talking about. And this is the first one. This is a, a tree with the winter creeper growing up it. And it, it spreads rapidly. I have been pulling it out of my beds since probably February. And the issue with winter creeper is that it stays green all winter long, again, allowing it to take in all those extra resources and have that competitive advantage of being able to grow while other plants can't. And this is an example, unfortunately, this is my backyard. I have been working on it. It's a, it's a work in progress. But this, as you can see on the fence, is winter creeper and it has grown so much from my neighbor's yard it has grown over into my fence and onto my ground. It is almost basically a carpet. And Japanese honeysuckle is more of an issue with landscaping. I just wanted everyone to see kind of what it looks like. This is a photo I found from MDC's website. And this will grow on your metal fences. It'll take over an entire woodland. It'll take over your whole house. It'll take over your whole life. The earth will just be covered in Japanese honeysuckle one day. And this is a really difficult one. So here's kind of just an idea of what it looks like. And English ivy, it's the least of all the evils, still fence encroacher, and unfortunately this is my backyard too, and even more unfortunately is that that English ivy is also growing on an invasive tree of heaven, but we're not going to discuss that today. Um, and so like I was talking about is garlic mustard, and garlic mustard is more of a noxious weed than it is an invasive plant. And so garlic mustard has high fecundity, which means it is able to reproduce a lot and really quickly and very successfully. So as you can see on the picture, which is kind of obnoxiously beautiful um, with the flowers on the top, uh, beneath them are spikes and those are actually all seeds. And then there's the picture on the right where it's more of the leaves and just a little bit of flower. So you can see how far down the flowers actually grow and all of those flowers generally will get pollinated and will go to seed and spread. And the issue too with garlic mustard is that not only will it spread via those seeds, but when you pull it, it can re-root. So you have to actually physically put it in a bag and throw it away because again, it will re-root. And so knowing all of these issues, it is kind of, um, you know, a doom and gloom kind of thing with invasive species, but there is a way we can get rid of them and we do need, it is a controversial subject, it's herbicide usage. Ideally, in a ideal world, we would not use herbicide. However, in large landscapes and in natural areas, there's no way of getting around using this. There are plenty of resources out there though to guide us and they, t they can guide homeowners into best practices and safety is always number one. We always wanna be the absolute most safe. And there's also ways, so this slide I'm showing you is a way to show you um, and like uh, natural resource management and in prairies on this slide on the left, not the one with the paper bag, you can see a coreopsis growing right next to honeysuckle. And so this honeysuckle needs to be removed so that we can allow space for the native plant to grow. So what I've done is taken a paper bag and I separate the two, I spray the honeysuckle so it does not drift onto the native coreopsis and I leave it there for just a minute enough time for it to dry appropriately and then I can remove that. So that's really one way in our garden beds that we're able to use herbicides safely without letting it get onto anything. And when you do spray you need to make sure that you are wearing gloves, closed-toed shoes, long sleeve, long pants, eyewear, eyewear, and very importantly never ever spray anything that is above your head as it can come back and drift onto you. You also need to make sure to spray, not spray into the wind. And another very important thing is with certain herbicides, and I do have a link to what herbicides can't be used in the heat, they cannot be used in the heat. It'll cause herbicide drift, which takes these herbicides and it will put them on any other plant all around and it can kill a lot of things and also harm pollinators. So I selectively spray like I'm showing here. And there are um, the other things to treat. So this is another way to treat honeysuckle. And you don't wanna do this with every, every honeysuckle. It, 
it's impractical for anything that's smaller. So what you want to do, this is, I was out at a nature preserve, just cutting down honeysuckle and you, the, oh, the picture on the left is of me using loppers to cut it and then stump treating it, which is a way to get herbicide into it that's not a foliar spray and it can kill the plant. Although, best practice in my opinion for honeysuckle removal, and I would recommend this to anyone that has a lot of time uh, and resources, I, I like to do a foliar treatment for honeysuckle. It is extremely aggressive and extremely detrimental to our native woodlands. And it has been growing in all of my garden beds and I have to keep pulling it out. So I do a foliar spray. I let that foliar spray sit on the honeysuckle for two days. This allows it to penetrate into the plant and get into the plant. Then two days later, I go and I cut it down and I do a stump treatment. This is very excessive, but with invasive plants, they're quite aggressive. And it's honestly the measures that need to be taken. And with English ivy and um, winter creeper and Japanese honeysuckle, you can, you can pull it without treating it as long as you want to be pulling it every single day for the next three years of your life because they also produce seeds and those seeds get into the ground and cause a seed bank. So you're gonna be pulling it, you're gonna be disturbing that soil and you're gonna be allowing the seeds to plant. If you do a foliar spray, honestly, you need to do it about once a week, check it, do another foliar spray if it's not dying and do this for a month. And that will really help you out for the entire season. If you do it safely and you follow the guidelines and you just keep yourself protected with all that. Um, garlic mustard's a little different. It, it, when you use a foliar spray, it tends to just kind of melt. Uh, I, again, I always pull it and I put it in a plastic bag. You can eat it if, if you want to, you know, utilize it. It's edible and like lamb's quarters, which is not invasive, but so you can eat garlic mustard, but it, it will reroot. I want to make that very clear that garlic mustard cannot just be pulled and set aside. It needs to be completely removed off the site or it'll never go away. And another thing to remember when you are using a foliar spray, which is an herbicide applied to the leaves, never do it when it is flowering. I, that is awful for pollinators. The, you know, there's sometimes you can't help it. Uh, Lespedeza sericea, you, you can't help it. You're gonna have to just treat it when you have to treat it. But when you can, we're all home gardeners. Those of us who are home gardeners don't, treat, don't do a foliar herbicide when it is in flower. And all of this doom and gloom about invasive species can kind of get us down, but you know, it's, we're working towards something. We're working towards beauty. And when we remove them, we have opportunities. This is a gorgeous woodland that has had honeysuckle removed. And once it's removed, there is a great biodiversity that happens. And these are all incredible native plants. So even just doing this in our gardens and in our garden beds, it keeps everything looking nice and tidy. It allows, you know, happy pollinator health and it's, it's better for our plants. It's better for our native plants. It stops the competition with our native plants. So I see only benefits to removing invasive species. Again, I did study this for years. And so the effect of native species or invasive species in our woodlands and in our prairies and in our homes can be detrimental. So if we get it on it now, then we can tackle it a lot easier in the really, really intense heat of summer, which nobody wants to be pulling weeds in summer and we can just enjoy our yards. And uh, that is about all I have to say, unless anybody would like to hear me go on and on and on about my hatred for bush honeysuckle in Kansas, Missouri. Your passion is evident. I love it. <laughs> but we do have some questions if you have a few moments for us. Of course I do. Happily. Excellent. Okay, so Kathleen asks, how, do you dis how does one distinguish between invasive honeysuckle and native honeysuckle? Is that the opposite versus alternate or is that something else? That would be something else. Um, there is a type of process called keying out. So, I mean, and I'll be honest, the it's 2020 google is an amazing source uh if you do that and i also follow missouri wildflowers on facebook and they are so quick at getting back to you about 
you know, their, their plant stock, if you're interested in it, but you can even just look at their pictures and compare it with invasive honeysuckle pictures. Often the flower is different, it's different colored, um, and bush honeysuckle has those very distinct thicker leaves and the big, big red berries. Excellent, thank you. Yes. So um, Lewis asked two different questions. The first is, um, quote, I have killed off some of the bush honeysuckle from a forested area in my backyard. What can I now plant in there to plant in their place to present to prevent the honeysuckle from returning? There are a lot of really good species for that. Um, if it's shady, I highly recommend Acara or uh, Golden Groundswell, I think is what its common name is. I planted about three plants last year and seeded in an area. I think I maybe used one ounce of seed and the entire area is flowering and blooming right now. It grows very quickly. So any native plant that is going to quickly grow like Pacara for a shady area, um, a sun area, you could use Coreopsis lanceolata. It gets a little taller. So if that's not an option, but I really like those. They're really fast growers. Uh, any I say, I would say more on the aggressive side of native plants, any annual native plants like partridge pea is a really good option too, because it'll grow quickly and grow so that the honeysuckle doesn't have time. That's good advice. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Cindy would like to ask, what do you do if you have invasive plants growing in a marsh type setting? There are a ton of insects, reptiles, and amphibians, and I'm afraid to hurt those ecosystems with herbicide. That, so I actually have a link <laughs> for um, herbicide uses. I found it on Johnson County Parks and Rec's Public Works website. It is an extremely helpful web page. There are options pulling, but sometimes you just have to spray. Use the very minimal amount. If you need to do a foliar spray, I mean, and you have time, take a tiny little paintbrush and just paint it on the leaves. Um, and stump treating is always an option. I generally don't do it on anything that's smaller than a centimeter because I don't like to, but you can, it's not impossible. You just have to, you can, you know, like apply it again with a paintbrush or a Q-tip or something like that. Excellent. Well, I have two similar questions here. One is um, what foliar spray and stump treatments do you recommend? And um, same for the herbicides, like what do you recommend for the foliar spray? So for foliar spray, I always use a glyphosate, and there are a lot of recommendations out there that can help guide homeowners um, into how they should use it. There's always guides like that. Um, the stump treatment, I use Tordon, and you can actually, if you dilute it, it can be somewhat used as a foliar spray. I don't recommend it. I would do a glyphosate and then Tordon, it's that blue stuff. Um, and there are plenty of other options, but those are the easiest accessible ones. And there are also selected herbicides you can use for grasses, like Johnson grass. But I would look into your city ordinances and your public works wherever you live, because they are there to help you and give you those um, vital information to find on what type of herbicide to use and how to get it. Excellent, thank you. Um, Joe Oliver would like to ask, are Creeping Charlie similar to Winter Creeper, and how do Charlies get removed? I'm not positive what Creeping Charlies are, and um, I'm less familiar with all of the common names, but I'm just going to do a quick little check here. So what was the second part of that question? Um, so asking about the similar, are they similar, and then how do you remove Creeping Charlie? So for any type of vine, if it's a vine, um, oh, well, it's in the mint family. Good luck. <laughs> uh, pull and pull and pull. If you don't want to treat with herbicides, I would do, a, if you're going to treat it, do a foliar spray. And the best time to do it is in the spring or in the fall. And same with honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, because like I said, and I'm sure this is similar, it greens out before everything and it stays green after everything's died. So when you do a foliar spray and the only thing alive is our invasive plants, that's the things that are gonna die. And so seeing that the Creeping Charlies are in the mint family, they're gonna be really aggressive. I would pull them, I would foliar spray them, give them a good 24 hours with a spray though. Gentle. Excellent, thank you. 
What is your advice for um, controlling Lespedisa? Uh, drink a beer, cry <laughs> a lot, um, and stay on it. <laughs> you have to go out, honestly, every day, especially if you're treating in a natural area. I would mark it so you can use your Apple and Google Maps and put it. I, I always like to put a little GPS marker on there, so I always know where to go back to and check. And so Lespedisa has, it will have a seed bank in the soil for up to three years. So it is going to be a process. And if you don't do it every single year, it's gonna keep growing and growing back. Um, and if you have people around you with it and they don't mind you treating their area, ask them if you can. It doesn't take a lot. I think a lot of people use pasture guard for it because it's a woody species. Um, just spray it and if it's by really quality things, like in a prairie, do the, the bag or cardboard, whatever, just separate it, spray it, come back every day and look. It's a very, very aggressive plant with, it's, it has very high fecundity, which means every, like, it, it produces a lot of seed and a lot of offspring. So it's very healthy in those areas. Very good. Um, okay, so Teresa asks, is it possible to bag garlic mustard long enough to kill it and then compost it, or does it have to be thrown into the landfill? No, absolutely not. You can, of course, do that. It's somewhat similar to um, what, what I like to do when I get my beds prepped over winter is lay black plastic or black sheet out over, and the sun comes and warms it all up, and they grow, and then they die immediately because there's nothing else because they're really warm. So you can kill it. Um, I have made a puree out of it with oil and it's pretty okay. It's a little bit bitter. So you have to, you know, really spice it up with some salt. But if you don't want to totally waste it, then eat it. Excellent. I love your creativity. So, um, so Joan has done something very similar. She said, I've been clearing bush honeysuckle from, from a small woods for about three years and she's beginning to see progress. I'm getting rewarded with all sorts of native wildflowers popping up. So well worth the effort. So I think you have a disciple. <laughs> Yay, good. It is, it is worth it. It seems like there's no end in sight sometimes and that, you know, like you're just in this understory with no light coming through because it's all honeysuckle but you spend one hour removing it and it is so satisfying because you just look, it's a brand new forest, it's a brand new woodland and you go back the next year and yeah, you're gonna have to keep removing it, but you find things that grow. It's just, it's an incredible experience to remove these things and see your progress as you do it. It's wonderful. So do you have any, we have several more questions on the table, but we are running up onto 4.30. So what we will do with the unanswered questions is we'll capture them, share them with Kristen. She can take some time, send them back to us, and we will get all that we can answered. Do you have any closing remarks before we end our afternoon? You know, just there's always light at the end of the tunnel in this pandemic and invasive species removal. Find something out there that brings you joy be it plants, be it your cats, just find something about the work you're doing that to make you enjoy it because it's going to be worth it. And, but sometimes it's hard to see that. So find your joy. Kristen, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I will say that one of my joys has actually been this webinar series the last six weeks. It is Deep Roots is surrounded by partners and professionals like you that are passionate and so smart and knowledgeable. And I just feel like I'm drinking up the knowledge and learning so much along the way. So I'm really appreciative of it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me do this. I have enjoyed it very much and I've enjoyed the series as well. So thank you guys. Excellent. Well, to our broader audience, thank you again for joining us this afternoon, and I'm sure we're all giving a virtual round of applause to Kristen. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so at the end of this webinar, um, please take a moment to participate in a short survey. It will help us better serve you both in live events and virtual events in the future. And also, if you have a moment, please visit our website at deeprootskc.org. We can help you find native plants, plant a garden, and more. If you liked what you heard today and would like to support Deep Roots and our webinar series, please consider making a donation. So thanks very much everyone for joining us. Thank you again, Kristen. Have a terrific afternoon and it's gorgeous outside. So if you have a chance, let's go outside and play. Stay Yay. healthy everyone. <laughs>